Hello, and welcome to a very special series I am moderating on diversity, equity, and inclusivity by CME Outfitters. This CMEO briefcase is entitled Take Action, Optimizing Equity in Cardiology Care. This program is sponsored by an educational grant by Johnson & Johnson. My name is Dr. Monica Peek, and I'm the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago, where I also serve as the Director of Research for the McLean Center of Clinical Medical Ethics, and I'm also the Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity. I'm also a practicing uh, clinical internist where I've been seeing patients here on the south side of Chicago for more than 20 years. It's one of the greatest joys of my life. And I'm a bioethicist and health services researcher. I am delighted to be joined today by one of my distinguished colleagues, Mercedes Carnathon. Uh, Dr. Carnathon, would you mind introducing yourself to our audience today? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Peek. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about this important topic. I am the Mary Harris Thompson Professor and Chair of the Department of Preventive Medicine at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I've been on the faculty here for over 20 years and during that time have really, have done a lot of work describing the burden and disparities in the major causes of death in the United States really with the central focus on cardiovascular diseases. And so I'm really excited to have this opportunity to, to speak with our audience today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I just uh, am really excited because I have cited your work. Your work has been um, yours and those at Northwestern and many of the people that you work with has really been groundbreaking in our understanding of some of the mechanisms through which stress and discrimination um, impact cardiovascular health and contribute to some of the health disparities that we see amongst marginalized populations. And so it's really an honor to have you with us today. Well, thank um, you so much. It's great to be able to partner with you in this endeavor since you're on the ground treating the very patients that we research. Absolutely. So thank you. Before we begin, I just want to note that this program uh, was designed to build upon the foundational concepts that we've already covered in some of our previous DEI activities. So to learn more about the impact of systemic racism on healthcare and health disparities, as well as how racial and ethnic disparities may present in cardiology, we encourage you to engage in these foundational programs, which are linked here. Also, if you participate in three or more activities, you're eligible for a digital badge that demonstrates your own personal commitment to health on health equity. So before we begin, I wanna clarify that as colleagues, uh, Mercedes and I decided that we would refer to each other by our first name since we know each other, our good friends and colleagues, just to make the, uh, this session more collegial. So Mercedes, I really look forward to our case discussion today and our very uh, candid conversation and really sort of um, eye-opening and uh, a frank conversation that we hope will be really helpful for our listeners. I'm going to start by reviewing our first learning objective for the program, which is to implement strategies to address inequities in the treatment and outcomes of patients with cardiology disorders. And we'll begin by focusing on cardiovascular diseases such as uncontrolled hypertension and atrial fibrillation. So I'd first like to open our program with a question for our audience uh, to get a sense of how comfortable our audience is um, before we begin the program. And so the question is, how confident are you in your ability to identify disparities in access to healthcare for other social and economic resources for patients with cardiac conditions, either not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident, or extremely confident? And I encourage everyone to be as um, honest and transparent as possible. It just helps us get a, a baseline assessment of how uh, we're doing for our audience. And so let's jump right into our patient case. Uh, Mercedes, would you mind presenting Derek, whose pronouns are he and him, to our audience today? Yes, I'm happy to do so. Uh, so Derek is a 40-year-old African-American man. He is a veteran of the Afghanistani-Iraqi war, who's currently working as an administrative assistant for more than full-time, 55 hours a week, and a very high-stress uh, brokerage firm. He has a history of hypertension, as well as a family history of early myocardial infarction, having had family members um, experience the events before the age of 55, as well as a family history of stroke. He engages in uh, endurance running, uh, which has been a pastime of his for some time. Uh, these days he needs to uh, try to fit that in around his very busy work schedule. He has lasting pain, um, possibly stemming from his military service, and he uses ibuprofen daily for back and neck pain. 
he's here today to see his primary care provider for anxiety attacks as well as chest pain that's troubling him. And he's currently using um, two medications uh, for his blood pressure, hydrochlorothiazide at 50 milligrams daily and amlodipine, five milligrams twice a day. There are a few things that stand out about Derek uh, namely his service as a veteran. Um, we do see higher rates uh, when we look in our data in the population of individuals who've served in the war. He currently has a very high stress, low control job with a lot of demands. And all of that against the backdrop of a family history uh, make it critically important for us to think about the entire patient when we consider how to manage Derek. Thank you so much, Mercedes. And so now I think it might be helpful to ask the audience about their um, thoughts and experiences around disparities in uncontrolled hypertension before moving into some of our discussion on diagnoses. And so you'll see the question on the screen. And so which of the following statements regarding disparities in uncontrolled hypertension is the most accurate? That white LGBTQIA plus patients are treated at the same rate as non-white um, LGBTQIA patients. Is it B, that exposure to wildfires and burn pits do not have any influence on cardiovascular or hypertension outcomes? Is it C, that high work demands and low control jobs influence uncontrolled hypertension for men, but not women? Is it D, that hypertension is diagnosed earlier in non-Hispanic black patients than in non-Hispanic white patients, or is it just E, I have no idea, <laughs> which is always sort of an honest and, and safe answer. And so for our audience, the answer is D. And so Mercedes, would you mind walking through some of the information on disparities of diagnosis and to highlight why that is the appropriate answer? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we've observed over time is that non-Hispanic Black patients are diagnosed with hypertension earlier in life and experience up to five times greater mortality um, due to hypertension as compared with non-Hispanic white patients. Men and women who are engaged in high demand, low control um, work settings tend to also face higher rates and a higher prevalence of uncontrolled hypertension. The underserved populations, typically underserved based on race or ethnicity or sexual orientation and gender status um, are also communities that are at higher risk of hypertension. And one of the things that we found through studies of our veterans are that very many veterans have uncontrolled high blood pressure with other cardiovascular risk factors that are also layered upon that that lead to higher rates of um, complications, um, not just um, complications stemming directly from hypertension, but atrial fibrillation as well. And, and this particular um, patient, Derek, lives in a region where there are wildfires. Um, the smoke and the pollution coming from those wild, um, wildfires and burn pits are also known to increase the risks of hypertension. And that's particularly something that we're going to see more and more of in the coming years. The wildfire season is increasing. There are more areas of the country that are having wildfires. And so for even those of us who aren't firefighters, more of us are being exposed to the smoke and inhalation and pollution that it comes with these large wildfires. And so um, many more of us are being exposed to some of the uh, contaminants um, that go with uh that we normally may think about people who are actually in the in the firefighting um, workforce, but many more of the population are, are starting to be exposed. So thanks so much for that information specifically about Derek. Let's get back to the case and what more can you tell me about him? Yeah, so today when Derek came in, um, his vital status was um, measured. His blood pressure is, is very high, 157 over 94, despite being on two blood pressure medications. Heart rate was in a fairly normal range. Um, his height and weight um, place him at a BMI level that falls within the category of obesity. And with obesity's um, in attendant risks of other cardiovascular and other complications. His uh, blood labs were also fairly abnormal. Um, he had relatively high um, 
low density um, lipoprotein cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, his EGFR levels have fallen over the course of three months. And his triglycerides are also very high. Um, proteinuria levels were 15 milligrams per millimole per liter, and his CHAD score was one. The uh, treating physician ordered an EKG and an echocardiogram. But I think what was most notable that despite these very concerning lab values and vital statistics, he was willing to take medications. He's already taking at least two medications, but he did at least feel comfortable to articulate his concerns about taking additional medications that might make him feel tired, fatigued, or decrease his libido. Apparently, he's got a very busy life with his job, with other family care responsibilities. And in addition to treating himself, he needs to be able to continue to perform um, his various social and social roles in life. You know, that's something that I hear a lot from our patients, my patients in clinic, um, particularly from men, um, the concerns about not only the fatigue, particularly that come from maybe beta blockers, which we know are first in line when we think about cardiovascular care, um, but also the concerns about um, erectile dysfunction. And so some of the non-adherence to medications amongst male populations that uh, we see um, is a challenge um, for their overall health and their overall cardiovascular health because of some of these underlying concerns. And so it's great that he brought that up in the clinical encounter so that we can mm -hmm. directly address it because we have so many medications, we have so many um, opportunities to discuss how we can put that into his overall plan of care and still keep him healthy. Um, so you've given us a lot of great reminders about how to assess patients. And so now I wanna bring it back to the audience um, and ask a question about disparities regarding the treatment of uncontrolled hypertension before moving on to our next discussion. And so uh, the question is, which of the following statements regarding disparities in the treatment of uncontrolled hypertension is the most accurate? Is it A, that Asian patients have similar control rates as non-Hispanic white patients? B, economic and social conditions do not play a role in uncontrolled hypertension or treatment-resistant hypertension. C, Latin or Asian patients have lower hypertension awareness compared to black and white uh, patients with hypertension. Is it D, there's so many options, uh, that black patients should always be given first-line calcium antagonists or thiazide diuretics for hypertension based on evidence, uh, uh, our evidence-based uh, guidelines, or is it E that I don't know? And so uh, for our audience, the answer is C. And so Mercedes, once again, can you discuss some of the data uh, that uh, around treatment disparities uh, and uncontrolled hypertension that supports this answer? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Monica. I think it surprises people when they hear that the awareness rates of hypertension are very high in black patients. And in fact, that they are comparable to that of white patients, despite what we know about the rates of hypertension being much higher in black patients, as well as other non-white groups. Mm -hmm. And so I think what this does is it really presents us with a challenge to try to understand this. Right. Um, and one of the other challenges, really, the hypertension control rates are much lower. Um, they're much lower in Asian patients as compared with um, other with with white patients. They're much lower in Hispanic patients. And some of the reasons for this, despite knowing about hypertension, despite knowing that medication is needed and lifestyle change is warranted, people who experience various adverse effects from economic and social conditions are much more likely to suffer uncontrolled as well as treatment resistant hypertension. Mm -hmm. And the uh, race based uh, prescriptions, these ideas about um, different uh, medications that would better treat, and I'll be interested to hear more about that from you, Monica, um, that, you know, despite these race based formulas that we think about to treat hypertension, we still see this and these disparities in control persist and they magnify and become disparities 
in a range of other cardiovascular conditions. And we have to be very thoughtful too about immigrant groups in the United States, people who are new to the United States who may not engage in a um, preventive context as readily, who are, are maybe less likely to be aware of their hypertension and to know that there are ways that they can measure it at home, bring their concerns to their doctors so that treatments can be started to stop the earlier onset of hypertension. Right. One of the take home messages for me in seeing this data is that we have had numerous um, public health campaigns about the importance of awareness. And so I think that um, everyone in the black community, black churches, you know, we, we've all gotten the message that hypertension is an important problem. But despite that, um, there are other factors that still make it a challenge to control that issue. And so knowledge alone is not enough at the population level to keep Black people from disproportionately suffering from hypertension and the downstream effects of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, um, end organ damage, et cetera. And so we have to do more um, when we think about our public health approach, um, when we think about clinical practice, than just knowledge about, you know, do you have hypertension and screening for that. So thank you once again for this information. And once again, we're going to take it back to our patient case. And so how is Derek doing? So um, following the results from the EKG, um, the EKG was generally normal with a notched prolonged P wave. And when we think about what that P wave signifies, um, there is an increased uh, left atrial volume risk, which really I think poses concerns about the risks for AFib as well as acute coronary syndrome. Um, he had multiple elevated readings in the office uh, when he was uh, at the patient uh, at the office today, as well as at home when he has taken his blood pressure. The um, uncontrolled hypertension, again, you alluded to the risks for um, target end organ disease, cardiovascular disease. Um, we think about obviously the damage to the heart, but as well as kidney disease and the chest pain you know, it may be due to panic attacks and anxiety, could be ang angina. Um, these are all issues that the healthcare provider um, really needs to spend time addressing appropriate treatment options. However, rather than simply leaving it at the treatment options, really taking into account the context in which Derek lives. You know, we pointed out early how um, how many demands that he has on his time, his limited time and availability to exercise, as well as his concerns about caring for others. And so I think all of these need to be considered in context. And I'm curious how you would handle this situation in your practice, uh, Monica. Well, let's first ask the audience because this is a, um, a perfect time. We have an audience poll question. Um, um, and so the given... Derek's laboratory values and his initial assessment, which treatment options might be most appropriate? Where would our audience uh, next lean for the next um, a plan of care? And so is it to A, add a beta blocker? Is it B, change amlodipine to a different calcium channel blocker? C, add spironolactone to hydrochlorothiazide and amlodipine? D, add an ACE or an uh, ARB? or E, I don't know. And so for our audience, the answer is D. Um, and so Mercedes, can you walk us through why D is gonna be the best option for this patient? So D, um, the adding an ACE or an ARB is, particularly, um, is a particularly fruitful strategy given the benefits for kidney protection. Um, when we talked about the target end organ disease that hypertension uh, conveys for patients, um, those small vessels leading to the kidney are, are quite the target. And so adding that uh, ACE or ARB is an excellent first strategy. But, you know, giving medication is certainly one strategy. Whether or not one can actually follow the lifestyle recommendations that are likely to support that, whether or not there 
able to really mitigate their risks depends a lot on the context in which they live in. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is that if this doesn't happen, there are a number of adverse outcomes um, and many of the disparities and outcomes that we see. The leading cause of death in um, all race and ethnic groups in the United States and even worldwide is cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Hypertension is the leading modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease uh, that we face. We see astronomically high rates of hypertension in black adults, in certain Hispanic subgroups, and in certain Asian subgroups. We have to be very cognizant to not group these racial and ethnic groups too broadly, but to really focus on the heterogeneity among Hispanics and Latinos, as well as among Asians. The um, What we also see is that across the spectrum of race, uh, black adults are much more likely to have hypertension related mor morbidity as well as mortality, much more likely than white adults. Um, higher rates of fatal stroke, particularly at younger ages. And even when stroke isn't fatal, it can lead to significant loss of independence due to long-term physical and mental disability. Um, as well, when we think about our native populations, our indigenous groups, the um, American Indian and Alaskan native, uh, those populations as well have extremely high morbidity and mortality. And our access to reach those populations may be somewhat limited and really requires partnerships with uh, indigenous serving organizations, really thinking about ways in which we can get word out in an acceptable manner so that all of our individuals here can um, maximize their health. Absolutely. I, um, just yesterday, today uh, being uh, Monday, finished a two week stint on inpatient service, my second uh, two week stint for this summer. And it was filled with patients from the South side of Chicago who had complications from hypertension, um, strokes, heart attacks, in stage renal disease on dialysis, and one of the most um, and and significant morbidity and mortality. Um, you know, people who had multiple multiple strokes and were just unable to, you know, care for themselves. One of the most surprising was a young man who was in his early thirties um, and had problems with his kidneys starting at age 10, which mm -hmm. uh, because wow. of his significant obesity and um, was started on medicines for hypertension in his teens and mm. so um, had been on dialysis, you know, by the time he was in his twenties. Um, and so when they presented to me the case as a 36 year old man uh, with, you know, hypertension, and stage renal disease on dialysis, I'm like, does he have lupus? Like, does he, what, what caused his in-stage renal disease? And they were like his, I believe his hypertension. I said, well, he's 36. <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. You know, let's unroll. And so, yeah. And uh, so I said, let's go back in the chart. Let's go talk to the patient. Is this really the only, and it was. Um, mm, and my so goodness unbelievable, unbelievable, yeah. um, and driven by just significant morbid obesity um, and family history. And so it really is taking a disproportionate toll um, currently um, in some of our, our communities. Yeah, it certainly is. And we have people in our families who um, experience these same challenges. Absolutely. So um, let's move on to our second learning objective, which is to think about how we can implement actionable strategies um, to improve health equity in our very own practices and the important role of the entire care team. So once again, we're gonna start with a question for our audience. Um, you should see it now on our screen and it's how confident you are in your ability to utilize um, an appropriate screen for social drivers of health that consider factors such as the lived environment, diet, and other drivers of health when caring for patients with cardiac conditions. Are you not at all confident, which is totally fine? Are you somewhat confident, confident, or extremely confident? And we hope that wherever you are, you'll sort of move along um, 
uh, through this next uh, few minutes with our presentation with our excellent uh, guest. So Mercedes, I'm gonna ask you if you can share some of your insight and experience about how a patient like Derek may uniquely experience some difficulties with cardiovascular disease sort of in this setting of social drivers of health. Well, thank you so much, Monica, for bringing this up. I think quite often, um, certainly in the past, people have thought that there was a problem with the patient, the yes. patient who didn't comply or wouldn't comply. And that was before we really took into account the social and structural drivers of health. And when we think about these, we think about these as factors that influence one's access and quality to education and healthcare, their socioeconomic status. You know, how did that education translate into income and the resources that are needed to adhere to very many of our healthy lifestyle recommendations? You know, as you can imagine, someone who has limited time, someone who has limited income, if you're living in a city like Chicago, as we both do, Monica, you know, being able to be physically active over the winter would require access to a gym. That's to right. be able to exercise indoors. And when we think about the neighborhood and the neighborhood setting, you know, uh, a factor that I didn't allude to earlier is that neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested in um, by even the, the uh, prompt of historical redlining, those mm -hmm. neighborhoods are less likely to have healthy food stores where one can get um, diets that adhere to the DASH diet. Uh, those neighborhoods may not be safe for engaging in physical activity. And again, then there's the real biggie that's difficult to talk about is the impact of structural racism and discrimination in providing access or limiting the capacity for one to maximize their health. These social and structural drivers of health equity really inform the community context. I alluded to the food environment, material resources, even sleep, which is a major portion of my research, you know, oftentimes when there's uncontrolled hypertension, when we dig a little deeper, these people don't feel well rested when they wake up. Is that because their homes were too hot because they didn't have central air? Is that because of the internalized stressors from the neighborhoods that they live in? And a another biggie these days that I think really came to light following the pandemic is the importance of food insecurity. Can one afford to buy the types of foods that they need in order to protect their health? And again, the lived and personal experience. You or I may feel very comfortable bringing up issues with our doctors about um, why we can or cannot adhere to their recommendations, but mm -hmm. everyone doesn't. You know, you think right. about the challenging situation that somebody who's um, homosexual may feel, especially if they feel that their physician may not support or understand their position. And so all of these really inform one's ability to follow the recommendations that you're providing in clinic. Even though you're very aware of these social drivers of health, it really takes a complex and comprehensive care model to be able to address these so that people can maximize their health. Absolutely. And I'm so uh, glad that you brought up sleep um, as a social driver, because it's one that we don't think about enough, um, the relationship between sleep and health, but one that disproportionately impacts those who are low income for a range of reasons. Like you said, um, they may be living in environments where the housing um, itself may not uh, predispose them to, to a good night's rest or the things that are going on outside the home. They may be worried about safety or hearing gunfire, or they may be working the night shift um, mm -hmm. or the shift yeah. workers um, cannot keep their sleep-wake cycle, their circadian rhythm, you know, on a normal cycle. And that is harmful to your health. And who are the shift workers? Marginalized populations. And so that just shaves years right off your life, just yeah. starting right there and makes your diabetes um, less well-controlled and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So all of these are important drivers that we may not think about how they may be disproportionately represented in marginalized communities. Um, and it may so even be for uh, someone who's a firefighter, um, like hospital workers, fires happen all the time. <laughs> the hospitals, mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so thank you, Mercedes, once again. And so let's check back in with Derek and see how the team has done with considering his social drivers of health. You know, thank you so much for bringing those, those factors up. And when the um, treating uh, clinicians spoke with Derek, they learned a lot about his lifestyle. And he underwent a, a comprehensive uh, screening for the social drivers of health. He lives in um, California, Bodfish, California, where he has to commute very long distances to Los Angeles for work. And that's because he simply can't afford to live very close to his job. However, because of long hours at his high demand workplace, sometimes he spends the night with friends who live in the city. Sometimes he goes back to his own home. So he doesn't have a regular quiet place to rest. When he finds himself needing to prepare meals, they're often quick, they're frozen meals. If he's cooking from home or if he's grabbing fast food on the run so that he can turn back around and get to work. And he tries to pack that work into big blocks of time because he has significant caregiving responsibilities. In addition to his three children, he has an aging mother who he also cares for and has to um, provide some both emotional as well as structural and financial support. So while you hear that he works for a high stress brokerage firm and you often might by default think that he has excellent health care or an outstanding income, Many times in marginalized groups, that same amount of income is going to care for multiple people across multiple generations. He's really the epitome of that sandwich generation with both, ch both children and an aging parent and without the nest egg that some families who've been able to pass down in an intergenerational wealth have. He does not have any of those. And as a result, he has difficulty affording medications, and he does endorse these socioeconomic difficulties. And while Southern California sounds quite a bit more appealing than Chicago, <laughs> for the most part, um, he is subject to smoke and pollution from the wildfires. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those layered on top make it very difficult when he wants to go for his out outdoor runs when he has that spare time that outside exercise, he's really breathing those particulates very deeply into his lungs. And so there's just a number of really complex factors that we would lay in your lap, Monica, and that of other providers to really consider when you consider how to treat Derek. Exactly. And one of the other things that I think is really important um, is that Derek doesn't present as someone who you may look at and say, oh, he has housing insecurity because he mm -hmm. has a home, but because of the circumstances of his life, he's not sleeping in his own home all the time. Sometimes he's sleeping in his car. Sometimes he's sleeping at a friend's place. And so he still has some of the very same things that some of our, you know, um, patients have who don't have a job, <laughs> you know, who, mm -hmm. who may have no home at all who may say that I'm very food insecure, who have no insurance and have extremely high, you know, cost barriers to prescriptions. And so you don't have to be at the far end of the income uh, spectrum to yeah. experience some of these um, factors that can impact your ability to live your best life. As far as feeling like, can I lay my head <laughs> You know, in mm -hmm. a quiet, peaceful place at night, do I know that I'm going to be able to prepare nutritious meals for myself and my children? You know, I can easily afford my medications. I can, you know, breathe clean air and exercise, you know, in my free time, despite him having a regular job with good, you know, in regular income, right. he is still having some of these very same barriers that someone who may not be employed at all has and may be living on the street. And so it's important that we screen people for these very same barriers. And when we did so at our institution, we were surprised at how high, at the high prevalence rate of many of these um, insecurities, these material needs insecurities that many of our patients face, despite having insurance, um, because of the complex way in which people's lives are lived, that they may manifest in their day-to-day -day life. And so... Um, 
I think it's really important for us to sort of consider all these things. And so to help our audience with actionable strategies to help improve equity mm-hmm. for their patients, I think we really should consider some of the social drivers of their health and, to, and how they may particularly impact cardiovascular disease. And so uh, Mercedes, can you mind, would you mind giving us some of your insight um, from your research experience and how patients like Derek um, may uniquely experience difficulties with cardiovascular disease? No, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing and really contextualizing a lot of that. Um, I know that obviously the story of patients like Derek and people who are like them resonate. And uh, for others who like to hear more about the data, um, some of the things that we have found through population research are that unhoused individuals are two to four times more likely to have hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases and to develop those at younger ages. And the younger age of development Uh, really translate into years of exposure to these detrimental cardiovascular risk factors. As many as half of unhoused individuals live in vehicles. So whereas we might have a picture of what an unhoused individual is, Mm -hmm. um, they are Derek and they are people like Derek who are working hard, but don't have the resources that they need. Um, Living in a car and commuting, given the high cost of living in some areas, also exposes people to pollution, pollutions via the commute, pollutions from cities, and even wildfires, if you're in areas that um, have that type of exposure. Each of these contribute to high blood pressure, as well as conditions such as atrial fibrillation. We talked about Uh, being able to grab food and eat on the run. These ultra-processed foods, which are highly palatable and and expensive, but with low nutritional value, as well as a lot of additives that can harm, um, increase the risks for high blood pressure, diabetes, other conditions, these are exposures for the development of uh, hypertension, um, atrial fibrillation, as well as other cardiovascular risk factors. And while Derek is working, Um, like other people, the affordability of blood pressure lowering medications can be a challenge, um, as well as finding places to pick those up. Uh, One has to maybe take off work to get to a pharmacy to be able to find them. Um, These can affect outcomes as well as affecting one's adherence. And then I would also really like to highlight a lot of the work on health literacy. Mm -hmm. Understanding what to do and how to make adaptations can be very challenging. And patients may be insecure about this and not say to the doctor, what does AFib mean? What is a CHAD score? How do I interpret an EGFR and adjust what I'm doing? Low health literacy is quite common. It is quite common even amongst those who have achieved um, educational credentials. And so always checking for understanding because low health literacy alone is a risk factor for hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. And really, we should assume that most people have low health literacy because Mm -hmm. that is a different language in and of itself. I remember my first year of medical school, I was like, oh, this is like learning Spanish. I'm learning a Mm -hmm. whole new language. And over time, it just became part of my natural vocabulary. And it's shorthand for other clinicians and, you know, people in research to be able to speak to each other. But we forget that this is sort of a tribal language that most people do not and really aren't supposed to know and that we have to retranslate that. It's our fault if mm-hmm. they don't understand you know, <laughs> what, what's happening. Um, again, just this past few weeks, a woman came in you know, for the third time in like six weeks because of problems with her mesenteric ischemia and when I told her she had mesenteric ischemia, and this is, I said, it's like angina. And I was, you know, going on and she was like, that's black girl magic. You have something <laughs> to me that I've never heard. And I was like, that, well, that's fascinating. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, she, she was so thankful. She, and, mm-hmm. and I know that people thought they had told her the diagnosis that she had had. Um, mm-hmm. But she, she had a plan of action. She was so thrilled, like I, she had won a lottery ticket, you know? And so she went home and I'm confident she won't be back. <laughs> She's like, I've got things to do. I'm supposed to have oh, my wonderful. party this weekend and I'm here in the mm-hmm. hospital. 
you know, but she had no idea really how she was supposed to be eating or living her life. And people were getting frustrated that she kept coming back in the hospital. Um, and so that was our bad, you know, mm-hmm. for, for not yes. explaining that to her. Um, so yeah, uh, all of these things are issues that can impact our patients' lives, but how many of them are ones that we take credit or onus or responsibility for addressing when they're in our care? Um, And so are there any other specific strategies that we know from your research on how to address social determinants of health, specifically to cardiovascular care? You know, there are so many factors. um, And when we think about where to devote our time and energy, uh, one of the things that we've learned is that the greatest impact on the community can come from structural changes to the environment. And that's not necessarily something that as physicians or other healthcare providers, it may be very difficult to address the structural environment. Mm -hmm. But what we wanna do is to be able to provide individuals um, at the one-on-one individual level, as well as the interpersonal level. So thinking about the families with the resources and awareness that they need to be able to adapt and make adjustments. Um, There's a lot of attention around sharing resources. Where are places that there are um, inexpensive farmer's markets where one can get food? Mm -hmm. What are some recipes that one can use that are appealing culturally to different individuals, but that adhere to DASH diet guidelines? What are the ways in which one can take exercise snacks, which is a nice phrase for short Mm -hmm. physical activity breaks, in order to boost their health. But what we really want to avoid are solely placing it on the individual to make all of the lifestyle changes needed, to adhere to medication, to find their medication, to make the lifestyle changes, to be motivated to persist through challenges without providing them with the supports. And the supports in terms of um, social, uh, if, if our social workers as needed, even handing out resources so that people can make positive changes. So those are the strategies to really think about the whole person when managing a disease condition. Absolutely. So there's sort of the socio-ecological model where there's the person, but they're Mm -hmm. layered around, you know, family and community and structural environments. And people don't make choices that are not constrained by their environments. And how can we make those environments most conducive for people to make healthy choices. Um, So thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, So we know that team-based care and collaboration are critical to improving patient outcomes, to helping to try and reverse some health disparities and to improving health equity. So I'm going to start uh, this section by asking our audience another confidence question. And so you should see it on our screen. And so the question is, how confident are you and your ability to manage cardiac conditions with a team-based or collaborative approach. Not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident or extremely confident. All right, so considering that the provider now has identified some social drivers impacting Derek's case, Mercedes now thinking about a team-based approach, who on the team should be involved so that we can help Derek live his best life and improve his overall care? You know, I think I mentioned a number of these individuals. I think uh, bolstering the medication therapy with um, uh, healthcare providers who can talk about the safety of exercise and the types of exercise that will be conducive to Derek's lifestyle where he has very limited time. Um, The idea about you know, endurance exercise, while it has its place, there are other ways in which he can very safely achieve his goals of lowering his blood pressure and managing his stress levels. Um, A case manager um, is ideally in place to assist Derek with exploring assistance programs so that he can find and afford healthy foods and working with a dietitian to understand what those could be and to come up with recipes that can work for his lifestyle, that his children will like, that his aging mother will like as well. Um, Because one is often not just preparing foods for themselves, but for others also. Um, Our veteran population, as well as many other populations who face a disproportionate burden of stress, can certainly stand to benefit from consultations with mental health specialists uh, to provide coping strategies, really think about um, motivational strategies, 
in order to help overcome many of these very real barriers. And the healthcare provider thankfully enrolled Derek in a chronic care management program for continued health education um, that will grow with him as he's able to make certain changes and then identifies challenges that are facing him that he didn't anticipate. But I think all of these in this comprehensive approach are really critically important to address these social drivers of health and address his hypertension control. Absolutely. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes an entire health yeah. team to sort of maximize the health of a patient. It is not, you know, a physician patient relationship. It is an entire team. So thank you so much for sort of re underscoring that. Um, and so as you've discussed, this team-based approach is really vital to improving health outcomes. So a patient can enter anywhere um, into the healthcare space and anyone on the team should feel confident to open that door to the patient to accessing other areas um, of the clinical team, be it the case manager, the dietitian, the mental health specialist, the primary care physician, the cardiology specialist, the chronic care uh, coordinator, all of these different people who are sort of surrounding Derek with sort of a, a big hug of love um, to help make sure that he can do the things that he needs to do as that individual to live his best life um, and feel supportive um, as he is not only in the healthcare system, but as he goes out in the community and is trying to navigate spaces and places where he's going to need to make sure that he does all the things, all the things um, to keep his health um, as a priority. And so uh, we really need to tell, be thinking about how we can lean into our patients and really listen to them and their living situations, the stress they have with caregiving, the stress on the job, the financial stress, and explore how all of these things aren't just like bothersome things that we're sort of, you know, listening to, to, you know, spend the time before we get down to the medical issues, but how these issues can impact how um, adherent they are to care and how they may impact how we change the care plan, um, who else we need to bring into to make sure that that care plan can be successful. And we need to make sure that we're creating safe spaces for patients to be able to talk about these very issues, to share their concerns with us, to talk about their belief systems that may run counter to sort of traditional Western medicine, that there's space for that, um, and to be able to ask questions about these important social drivers that they may be experiencing, which may have shame around them, which may be uncomfortable for us to talk about, um, but which may be really um, driving their behaviors um, and or their beliefs that can be harmful to their health. Do we need to bring in interpreters? Do we need to bring in additional nurses for support or case managers? Do we need people that can help our patients set goals um, and help um, share in decision-making so that our patients can really buy into these uh, treatment plans. Everyone needs to be on board with what our next steps are for care. The patients, their families, the healthcare team, we need to all be sort of growing in the same direction. Um, and we can only do that when we have all the information on the table, when everyone is excited about a feasible plan of care and have communicated that clearly. And um, so that is what we really need. And part of that information, a critical part of that information are these external social factors, which so frequently do not make it into the, the clinical conversation. And so um, Mercedes, Thank you for your expertise, for all the research that you do in this area. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Are there any key points that um, I've forgotten in sort of trying to summarize this? Um, and do you have any final thoughts that you want to add? You know, just the final thought I'd add, and I think you were extremely comprehensive in covering multiple points, is that one can't always tell who is being affected by these adverse social drivers of health. There is not a look to the type of patient who is experiencing these challenges. You know, Derek is our case today and he is an African-American man. There are gonna be individuals across every race and ethnic group who are disadvantaged or marginalized for various things that aren't immediately apparent, which is why it's critically important to do the assessment for the social drivers of health, get input from as many people as possible who've interacted with the patient. You know, when the scheduler is calling and they're noting that it's difficult to find time for the patient to come in, 
that type of input is also critically important. So that would just be the final point is that you won't know what people are facing unless you ask and asking everyone in a standardized manner and collecting that information allows for the best opportunity to provide the type of care that every individual deserves. Absolutely. I could not have said that better. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mercedes. What an honor spending time yeah. with you today. Um, so I hope that we've shared uh, with our audience some very actionable strategies um, while working through our patient case. And so now I'm going to ask the audience how confident <laughs> you feel in your ability to identify disparities in access to healthcare and other social and economic resources for patients with cardiac conditions. Not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident, or extremely confident. And a question about confidence and the ability to utilize an appropriate social screener for practice. Um, is that not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident, or extremely confident? And then our last question is how confident are you in your ability to manage cardiac conditions with a team-based or collaborative approach? Not at all confident, somewhat confident, confident, or extremely confident. And we hope that our program today has helped you move at least somewhat <laughs> along the spectrum. So Mercedes, again, just what a thoughtful and excellent discussion. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try and once again, summarize our discussion with some SMART goals. And those are goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. And this is what I hope that you as our audience will take away from this presentation and apply to your very own practice. And that is first, to identify disparities in the diagnosis and treatment of uncontrolled hypertension. Second, to identify the disparities that increase the risk of cardiac conditions, which when left unaddressed may progress to atrial fibrillation or acute coronary syndrome. Third, to integrate holistic treatment strategies, including screening for social drivers of health that can help improve equity and outcomes. And then to consider team-based strategies in the care of patients with cardiac conditions and really all conditions, but here we're talking about cardiac conditions to address inequities in treatment outcomes. And so as a reminder, uh, this CMEO briefcase is one of a four-part CME CE initiative, and we hope that you'll take advantage of and participate in all the activities in this series. These activities cover strategies to address racial and ethnic disparities across therapeutic areas, and I really encourage you to join us for the entire initiative. By participating in these activities, you demonstrate your own personal commitment to improving health equity for all of your patients. The CMEO DNI Hub also has a large number of resources available to you to help further your education on diversity, equity, and inclusivity. And so Mercedes, one last time, thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us for such a robust conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed hearing about your experiences, Monica, and speaking with our audience. Thank you again. And you're just a, a wealth of um, resources. Your research, again, has really helped shaped our national understanding of uh, these issues. And so thank you for your contributions previous to today. And thank <laughs> you for, uh, for being here with us. Um, so to receive credit for this activity, please complete the post-test and evaluation. We appreciate your feedback. We really want to hear from you. Tell us what you liked and how we can improve and what additional topics you'd like for us to address. And so I just really want to also thank you, our audience, uh, for your commitment to education, because together, all together, we can strive to provide the best and most equitable care for all of our patients, particularly those who are most undeserved. Thank you again for your time and for joining us today.